check the recording. Yep, mic is on. <coughs> All right. So I'm not sure whether I, I don't think I posted anything particularly new. Have we talked about these already? No, 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 yeah. no. Th these are some of these are new. Okay, that one is not, but this one is new. Um, this is a, an interesting project from Google. It's called a Project Tangle. Um, and if you look at Project Tangle, it does have to do with mobile apps because it is a you know Google experimental platform of um, of a mobile phone. But basically, it's a smartphone. So we'll go take a look, quick look at um, this one because I, I think it does have quite a bit of impact you know to this class and you know a lot of implication of what is to come. Um, Google's all ringing, all dancing, 3D sensing smartphone, and instead of talking about it, I'm going to turn on the video because they, they actually made a pretty good uh, presentation out of this thing. And the speaker is here. And I'm going to stop pause for now and let the speaker pick up first. Let's see whether that works. Check out the here, based in California. It doesn't work. Okay, there we go. My name is Johnny Lee, and I work in the Advanced Technology and Projects Group at Google. Our small team here, based in California, has been working with universities, research labs, and industrial partners to harvest the last 10 years of research in robotics and computer vision to concentrate that technology into a very unique mobile phone. We are physical beings that live in a 3D world, yet mobile devices today assume that the physical world ends at the boundaries of the screen. Our goal is to give mobile devices a human scale understanding of space and motion. This is going to allow people to interact with their environment in just a fundamentally different way. We can prototype in a couple hours something that would take us months or even years before because we didn't have this technology readily. And what happens if you have all of these pieces in a phone? How does that change what a phone is? We have created a prototype phone containing highly customized hardware and software designed to allow the phone to track its motion in full 3D in real time as you hold it. These sensors make over a quarter million 3D measurements every single second, updating the position and rotation of the phone, fusing this information into a single 3D model of the environment. We have a problem called navigation doors, and it's a solution to that problem. It tracks your position as you go around the world, and it also makes a map of that. Imagine that you scan a small section of your living room, and then are able to generate a little game world in it. I don't know of any other controller or gaming device that can do that at the moment. Putting all this together, they pulled in experts from all around the world, and got them all working on the same project. Brought up very high caliber people. Why? It's very simple. I think actually people believe in the vision. Localization and mapping is there on your phone and you just use it. It's this ability to follow in other people's footsteps. And we can also like, benefit from what we do for the project back for the open source community. Use it for visually impaired, give them auditory views on where they're going. You know, be able to map your home, uh, check out, let me see how this furniture looks in the room. Virtual windows to sort of different worlds. I mean, the possibilities are really endless. Over the next few months, we will be distributing dev kits to software developers to develop applications and algorithms on top of this platform. We are just in the beginning, and we know there is a lot more work to do, but we are excited about where this is going to go. The future is awesome, and we believe we can build it faster together. So this is an interesting, um, interesting product uh, because it's not really uh, a new <coughs> product because all the cell phones that you have already have accelerometers to measure acceleration. Be basically, that's what <coughs> we're measuring. But this device has enough uh, resolution to really do something useful with it. Instead of just you know using it to see which orientation your screen should be in, <laughs> or use it as a very crude you know, level. This gives you the ability to you know, track motion in real time with sufficient accuracy to map out you know, uh, where you have been, you know, how to get back to your car, and stuff like that. In other words, you know, uh, places where GPS does not work, 
for one reason or another, this will work. Um, it also gives you, you know, the ability to, uh, I think it senses rotation you know, by itself, which is not something that your uh, regular cell phone may be able to do because most cell phones come with one accelerometer. So if the rotation axis is around the sensor itself, it doesn't sense anything. Okay, it doesn't sense that it's being you know rotated on a certain axis. This one does. So I think it has multiple sensors in order to find out that it is actually being spun, and not you know just uh, <clears throat> not just you know the usual linear motion. Um, so I think you know it's really interesting. You know, at, at at least you know we should keep an eye on these things. The guy who's doing this, or, or the guy who's heading this particular project, his name is um, Johnny Chong Lee. And he has um, a previous fame already because of what he did with the Wiimote digital whiteboard. Um, in other words, you know, if you use a tripod and have a certain device to mount a, a, a Wiimote, does everybody understand what is a Wiimote? It's the little controller thing that you use with a Wii you know, uh, game system. Um, so what he did was uh, he you know, figured out you know, how that device talks to the Wii console using Bluetooth, so he cracked the, the protocol. And then he made it so that you can uh, plug in a USB uh, a blue, uh, Bluetooth dongle on a regular computer and have your computer communicate with your Wiimote. The Wiimote, you know, out of a Wii system is actually the intelligent piece. That's the one that is tracking your motion, is the Wiimote itself. So if you have a source that is an IR source, the Wiimote can actually report the coordinate of the IR source and as a result, you know, you just need a light pan that emits in infrared light, and then with the proper software, you can turn a Wiimote into a three, not a three D, but a uh, white, um, a uh, a whiteboard, a digital whiteboard. So you can actually draw stuff and write something, you know, using that technology. Um, so that's you know that's his uh, uh, claim to fame initially, uh, when he was still a graduate student over at uh, MIT. But now that he's, uh, he's recruited by Google to head uh, this project, I think there'll be some interesting things coming out. <coughs> so I think that's, that's cool. Uh, if you think about it, what kind of you know, application would be possible with this type of device, uh, I can think of just a few here. Uh, for instance, a very precise pedometer. Um, in other words, you know, it just measures you know, how you walk. But in this case, because the sensitivity is high enough and the resolution is high enough, it can actually know exactly how you walk and how far you have walked, okay? Which is much better in terms of you know, tracking how much exercise you have been doing because you know, regular pedometers don't really track a whole lot of things. They can, they can sense that you have taken steps, okay? Click, 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 click. But they don't know how wide of a pace you, you, know, you have. They don't know how far you have walked whether you're walking uphill, downhill, it, it, there's no, you know, no information. But with this, with this kind of device, you know, it would be possible. Uh, for people who like to tune cars, and sadly, I do not see as many people these days you know, as it was in the uh, 90s who would tune cars you know, all day long and just to try to squeeze that you know, last you know, quarter of a horse out of the engine. <clears throat> But for those people, you know, this kind of device can also be used to measure the zero to 60 acceleration time. Because it's not, it's not even just a number with this kind of device. You can actually see the entire curve and see how you know, the car performs in different gears and, and whatnot. So it's, you know, it, that's one, another application that, that can be done with this. Um, just as, as I'm speaking right now, I can think of a third application um, on race cars, they have um, a sensor called a G sensor. In other words, you know, it can sense you know how much lateral G the car is experiencing. So when you get to the you know close to the envelope of your traction, um, you know some of those devices can give the driver or the race driver a beep and say, okay, you're approaching the threshold of your traction, um, so, so that the driver would know you know that he's about to or he or she is about to run out of traction. And then he can plan accordingly. Okay, they, if that person wants to drift around the corner, you know that person can, you know, do whatever it needs to be done. And if that person does not want to drift and want to retain, you know, uh, traction, that person can do whatever it takes to do that. Um, and this kind of device can certainly do it because it is fast enough and responsive enough. They don't already have something like that. Um, I believe so, but it's a, it's a dedicated device, so its only job is to do, you know, G you know, force, you know, sensing. 
Um, but with this kind of device, you know, you can also use it for a variety of things. Um, for instance, you can get an ODB2 to Bluetooth uh, converter. So now the application can read just about everything about your car that your mechanic can, depending on whether it has the, uh, the, the vendor specific you know, uh, code to read everything. Uh, but you, it's conceivable, you know, because you know all the uh, new ca newer cars since '96 have ODB2, and you know when the the more recent it gets, the more information you can pull out of the uh, the ODB2 connection in real time. So we are not talking about you know after an accident or after you have the check engine light, you can you know inquire the computer and ask you know, what went wrong. Uh, but in real time, you can get you know easily engine temperature. Um, oxygen levels, you know, and all kinds of stuff like that. So the, the, the app can constantly monitor everything, you know, even for a race car driver or truck driver, okay, you know, for, for commercial drivers, it can do a lot of stuff that uh, previously would not be, you know, possible. <coughs> so this stuff is all coming, and obviously, you know, the, uh, since you know, Google also has Google, Google Glasses, when these two projects, you know, meet, it'll be even more exciting. Because now you have a you know a device about this size, maybe smaller and sleeker, that has you know all these you know, high resolution uh, sensor for motion, and as a result, it can tell exactly where you where you're you know facing, and change the uh, the projected image accordingly. Um, so augmented reality you know gets basically get a new dimension because of the higher resolution tracking. Uh, so all of these things are coming, and. I think they will open up possibilities that previously were not practical. Okay, you know, people might have thought of you know, doing these things, but because of the limitation of the sensors, it was not practical. And now it's, it looks like you know they are making enough technological changes so that that stuff you know can actually happen now. Yep. Well, my question is though, is how long, how many different technological advances do you have to have before a phone no longer becomes a phone? Um. In uh, most other countries, they don't use phones anymore. They don't call anymore. Uh, and that's why WhatsApp is such a big thing outside of the United States. But in the United States, uh, WhatsApp is relatively new. You know, not a whole lot of people knew about you know, WhatsApp until last week when uh, Facebook acquired uh, WhatsApp for $19 billion. That was the second largest uh, acquisition in uh, Silicon Valley, even with value adjusted. Large the largest one was HP acquiring Compaq. I was going to say most of the... That did not work out very well. <laughs> most of the acquisitions in Silicon Valley, uh, I mean, it's of all the like Google, <coughs> Apple yeah. type companies. Yeah, that's, 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 Okay, you, it's easy to use, you know, I still have my, still it on my phone, I still have it on my phone, and I still get, you know, messages, you know, from my buddies in Hong Kong. Um, it's just a very simple texting, you know, type of engine with no ad. Okay, that was the whole... WhatsApp Messenger? Yeah, WhatsApp. It's big in Canada, too. Oh, it's big in Canada, it's big in anywhere other than the United States. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. And, you know, in these countries, or in many countries, the voice plan is more expensive than the data plan. You know, when I was in Hong Kong, that was exactly the case. Okay, you know, if I want to get you know voice a voice plan with so many minutes, that's more expensive than you know a data plan that is that can allow me to communicate even more than you know just you know, having the voice part. Is that because their infrastructure is built up for the? Correct. That has to do with the infrastructure because uh, the 4G technology is different from the cell cellular technology just for the voice. And in Hong Kong, the, uh, they focus more on the, the digital networking you know, infrastructure. And I thought you know, for sure that in Hong Kong, the, the reception would be really bad because you know, in Central Valley, you can have one cell tower to surface you know, like a huge area, right? Because, of the, because you know, the land is flat and it's you know, just vast. And in Hong Kong, you know, they have you know, 30, 40, 50 story buildings you know, like throughout the entire you know, place. So you would think that you know, they would just block signal left and right. But one thing I forgot was they have a cell tower almost on top of each and every building. <laughs> I, I can be in an elevator right in the middle part of a concrete building and still get four bars out of four. 
and the speed is tremendous. I mean, we are talking about you know maximizing you know, the 4G potential here. Uh, same phone, you know, I'm just using my regular phone, but when I was in Hong Kong, I paid eighty dollars for one week, eighty Hong Kong dollars for a week, which is which amounts to about ten bucks in U.S. Um, and I was getting exceptional connections, you know, pretty much throughout. You know, it doesn't matter where I go, doesn't matter what time, it's just you know terrific. <clears throat> I have a funny story about that. Yeah. So when I was deployed, there was a company it's called Magic Island Technologies, and they sold cell phone and internet service. Cell phone service, like for just talk, was it, it was like a lo it was local, but it sprung up because of uh, all the KBR and stuff that were there. Anyway, cell phone service was like eighty dollars a month if you like compared it to another like contract cell phone. But data was about ten to fifteen dollars a month. You could have an internet connection and basically use that. So I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep, certainly is. All right. So last time we talked about you know how to use your know, one activity to start another one, and particularly the focus was on uh, can we pass information from one activity to the the, the other one, yeah, both from the one that is starting the other one going forward, and also from the one that is closing back to the one that started it in the first place. So that's what we talked about last time. I corrected the notes right after class. So all of the notes here are actually up to date and correct when it comes to how to start another activity. This code is correct. Um, in the activity that was started, this code is correct at, uh, you know, also. But this is only a method inside the class definition. And what you want to do is to use this portion here to get the parameter out of the, uh, the activity that started the other one. You know, the, this is from the perspective of the started activity. But this is how you get the parameter from the other one. When this acti activity is done, this is how you can set the result. And then back to the activity that started the whole thing, this is how you get the result back. So this code, you know, uh, all of these notes you know, are, is updated and you know, it should work the way it is intended. So are there any questions about you know, the activity starting another activity thing? For the most part, I would call that part, you know, call this technical details. Okay? It's really just a matter of figuring out how to do it. So today's focus is a little bit different because what we'll do today is to get back into um, a little bit of software engineering, you know, which basically it has to do with um, how do we design the software to make it easy to maintain <coughs> down the road. Okay. And the topic name is, you know, where to keep my apps logic and data. Well, what do you think? You know, without reading the notes here, you know, what do you think, you know, where are you gonna put the logic or the business logic of your app? Does everybody understand what is the business logic of an application? For instance, if I okay. sorry for expansion for expansion yeah or uh, uh. scalability for scalability yes but where do I put it? Yep. Are we talking about solely a on device business logic or a combination of device and uh, web service? Mm, let's say it is possible to put it to, to put it all on device. So we are talking about an app that does not require network connectivity. Then, uh, in their own uh, classes. In their own classes. That's okay. That's a good idea. Okay, so we can start with you know in our own classes. But now the question is, in our own classes, you know, where do we put it? So what I'll do is I'm going to write a very small app first. Um, it's uh, just a counter. You guys, you know, for those of you who go to Costco, there's a person sitting, you know, uh, at the entrance or standing at the entrance, and that person's only job is to count number of people getting into Costco, right? Does anyone have Costco membership? Okay. Don't they double as the checker for the card? Too? Yeah, they check, you know, their your um, your Costco, you know. ID and stuff, uh, not ID, but the Costco card membership. Yeah, that's it. They check membership and then they click a little counter, you know, at the same time. So let's say we just want to write an app to do the counter thing, which is a really easy thing to do, right? So let's go ahead and read, write it first. And the first time I write it, I'll write it the same way that I would normally do it, you know, intuitively, and how most developers would do it intuitively, which is, oh, I know all the technical detail, I'll just do it. Okay, without actually thinking it through, and make it you know flexible. Okay, so we'll we'll go ahead and you know take a look at this 
approach that many, you know, many developers would use. Okay, so we'll go to my ADT folder, go to Eclipse, and start off Eclipse. <coughs> and obviously there's a spoiler because I posted my uh, actual solution online as well. So if you read that one first, then you, you're going to say, well, why do we have to go through all that trouble? And also kind of keep in mind that, you know, what we talk about today, which is, you know, uh, what we call design patterns, um, it really, you don't see the importance of that until you're developing something that's complicated, uh, something that, that will, you know, have a lot of changes in the future. And I think that's partially why uh, Flappingbird, you know, the developer, you know, decided to give up because, you know, he may not have uh, developed the application in a structured way. <laughs> So with all the requests to change and enhance the software, you know, that may become, you know, really a difficult thing to do. The thing I read about him was that he was making 50K a day on AdClix from Google AdSense. And I oh, was okay. wondering if that was a cultural thing because he was being bombarded by media. And that's kind of how that made it sound that he was getting tired of the media. And I'm like, well, I would think you'd accept the media if you're getting 50 grand a day, no matter what culture you come from. I don't know. I mean, you know, in, in some culture, you know, people prefer to, I know people who prefer to, you know, you know, just make enough money and then, you know, spend the rest of the time just, you know, sitting around, you know, go fishing and, you know, relax. You know, $50,000 is a lot of money, but if you don't get the time to actually spend it and enjoy it, you know, it's still just, you know, a number, you know, on your bank account. If he, I mean, if he was making, he's not doing anything for that 50K. He's already done all the work that it earned it. So. That's true. <laughs> if he was making 50K a day, though, at the height of the popularity of that particular application, I mean, he'd be, that'd be somewhere in the ballpark neighborhood of a million dollars. He made it a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, he really wouldn't need A million it. dollars sounds like a lot of money, but it really is not. Well, I mean, depending on where you're from, though. That's true. The, the problem with a million dollars is it sounds like a lot of money, and then some people will start to spend, you know, <laughs> like they have a lot of money. But a million bucks, you know, on paper, depending on the taxation of, you know, the, the place in the United States, half of the, about half, you know, goes to Uncle Sam, right? Well, well I mean, he's developer, right? Sorry? I thought he was a Vietnamese developer. He is. He's what? Vietnam. Oh, Vietnam? Well, then it's a little bit worse because then all yes, the neighbors know that you you're rich now. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> all your relatives and all your neighbors know, oh, you know, so-and-so is now a, a rich man. Let's go you know, pay him a visit. <laughs> well, the, the individual tax rate of anyone over $250,000 a year is like 15 to 25% depending on how you get your income. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's still, let's just say he cleared $500,000 and you convert that to Vietnam currency. And, you know, like king. Yeah, that's ridiculous amount of money there. Yeah, well, as I said, you know, he would have, you know, people, you know, <laughs> visiting him, long lost, you know, relatives and friends. Plus, he was, he would get blown up on uh, social media services and whatnot. Yeah. And not to, yeah, well, let's go, let's go back to this one. Okay, I just wanted to make <laughs> a, uh, I just want to make an app that can do, uh, that can act as a counter, okay? So you would think, hey, how hard can that be, right? So. Um, for people who took CISP 362, the previous class, do you think you can whip out, you know, something using, you know, App Inventor in about 15 minutes? Yeah. Absolutely, right? Okay. So let's go ahead and do it in Java, which is a little bit more involved, you know, but it is still not as complicated as, you know, uh, many other things that we can do. Okay. So we'll go ahead and get started with this one. You know, we'll start with, um, the layout file because we need you know some buttons and uh, do some design here. So we'll go ahead and use uh, two buttons: one button to do the counting and the other button to uh, reset the counter. Okay. So I know you guys cannot really see what is going on. Let me see if I can change the resolution because the screen looks kind of more fuzzy than it should be. Let me check the resolution. It is the right resolution for whatever reason. It's not. Um, it's just not. Does it look fuzzy to you, or is it just my eyes? It, 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 it does look fuzzy. It could be the anti-aliasing uh, for that application, as well as the focusing of the yeah. projector. 
Okay, but that's okay. We, we'll just go ahead and change the label um, of this button here. And where's my property box? I hit it, I think. Right click. Let's see. Other properties. I lost my uh, property box. It's not there on the far right. You just have to press a little. Oh, just minimize. One. Restore. There we go. Oh, that's like really There we go. Okay, so this is called button one, and we'll go ahead and just do a very simple thing and change the text to uh, increment. Okay, so we'll just call this our increment button. And then the other one, we'll call that our um, reset button. So now we have a one button labeled increment to, you know, it increases the counter, and the other one is called reset, it resets the counter. The hello world label or text view will keep it so that we can use it to reflect the actual counter, okay? So now we have, you know, the user interface defined already. So that's what most people would start is the user interface, okay? When we talk about app programming or anything that involves, you know, user interface design, um, the developer typically will start with this part, okay? Because this is how everything gets triggered, okay? So it kind of makes sense that we start with this. And then we go into the app uh, main activity.java file, and we start to program the code or the logic into this thing here. So what we need to do is on create, we have to set up the on click listener um, handlers for those, uh, for those two buttons. Do you guys do remember how to do this part? Specifying the um, event listener, I mean, on click uh, hand listener of those uh, two buttons. Like um, frenzy, frenzy button. Yep. But before we do that, we have to do some extra import, right? Yeah. So we have to import android.view.view, and that should be enough already. Because a button is a view, and the on click listener actually is already defined in view. But I need to import that as well. So you can say import android dot view dot It'll do it for you. view dot oops. Oh, it's on click. Maybe it will. We'll find out. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, use find view by id r dot id dot um, those two are button one and button two and it doesn't show here because I have not saved all the files so it's not uh, synchronized at this point once I save the files close this and then use the dot again now it shows up in other words you know you kind of have to remember to do this too when you are writing your app is if you make any changes to the layout, if you add additional you know, buttons, text boxes, and whatnot, you have to remember to save the files before the intelligent editor feature knows about those features and be able to use it to help you, prompt you for uh, these items. So we'll go ahead and reprogram button one first, which is a really awful name, because it should have said what? Button increment. Okay, because button one doesn't say what the button is doing. But remember, I'm trying to model the behavior of a hasty developer, which most developers are. <laughs> okay, so I'm just, I just, I just try my best to whip this application out as quickly as possible. <coughs> we'll go ahead and set the on click listener and give it the anonymous class to do this. So it's going to be new, um, on click listener, and it's complaining because it doesn't yeah, know where it, it is. So we'll go ahead and import on click listener from view. That solved that problem. Awesome. Yep, yeah, it is. <laughs> and now we can just go ahead and specify the on click, which is a public void on click view b and then we have to specify what it's supposed to do here okay you know that's ah okay we have to increment a, uh, a counter in this case so we need to keep track of that counter 
And that means you know, I have to go back here and declare a private integer as my actual counter value. So we'll just call this counter value. And since I know that Java can do this, I don't even need to specify my you know, unique um, constructor. I can just say when an object is created out of this class, automatically initialize uh, counter value to zero. Okay? So I'm trying to be as hasty as I possibly can. But not really quite there because you know if I were really even hastier, I would have copied and pasted the code from you know some other program first. Okay, but I'm actually still going through this to do it. So I'll go ahead and increment you know counter value. Okay, and the fact that I can do this, you know, we talked about this already. Even though counter value is not a member of the anonymous class. The anonymous class is actually has visibility of the enclosing class, and that's why you can access the uh, a member of the including class, uh, which is really weird because the in many ways this anonymous class is almost acting as a subclass of the enclosing one. In other words, the anonymous class that we are in at this point is almost like it is extending main activity itself. Because otherwise, it would not have access to all of those things, which are instance specific. It is not just class specific; it is instance specific. Okay. So after we do this, we better update the actual value, right? So how do we update the value of um, of the uh, uh, text view item on the screen, which says "Hello World" at this point? Find view by ID, the, n the label, and set text. Okay, find view by ID actually does not work. <laughs> okay, I, I can show you exactly why it's not going to work. Okay, so I would say find view by ID and open parent something. And if I hover over this, okay, okay, fine. Okay. Uh, in the type activity is not apl applicable. You don't have anything oh, in there. It does have. Okay, so if I specify r dot id dot button one text oh text view one, huh? It allows me to do it. So that's another you know, reason I think you know this is actually as it's basically acting as a subclass of a main activity. Okay, so what do I want to do with this? I want to do a set text here. In other words, I want to specify. Oops, not text alignment. Set text. That's what we do. Well, I cannot do this because uh, a regular view doesn't do that. I have to first cast it to a text view first. Okay, so we'll cast it to a text view. So cast this whole thing. And it should complain that text view is not known yet. Oh, I missed some parentheses. You have an exit ending parenthesis. After view one, you have the end parenthesis. Parenthesis. Yeah, but that, there are two open here also. No, there isn't. You already have it closed. There's one here, and there's one here. It doesn't know the text view is a is a class because it's not imported yet. Syntax error. Assignment operator, so it's expecting me to do something with it. All right, fine. Let me do this. Then. Okay, we need one extra pair of parentheses. There we go. Now we can say set text, and it's complaining because it doesn't know what is a text view. So this time it doesn't know what to do with it, and mm -hmm. I have to do it manually. Import Android view. That may be the wrong path. It's under widget. There we go. <coughs> so now when we get back to here, set text is now a, uh, a method. So the uh, the prompter is not you know exactly all intelligent. I was expecting it to find out. Oh, okay. You know, we have a type name that is not found. 
or not defined at this point. But I can see that you know one of the classes has the same name. You know, did you actually mean to use that? It did not prompt me at all this time. So I was using probably a feature that the uh, smart editor was not designed to deal with, which is you know, type casting. All right. So we want to set the text to the number representation of counter value. Okay. So the question now is, how do we do that? Well, if you read my notes, you know there's actually a place to put it already. So let's try this first. Okay. We'll try counter value first. And counter value is an integer. And it looks like it takes it. So the question is, you know, why is it taking it? And the second question is, is this you know, good programming practice? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> probably not. Yep, it is not a good programming practice. But the question, the, the other question is, why does it even work? Okay, let me let me go back a little bit, and well, we can use a, a web browser. Let me switch to a web browser. And then we'll take a look at Android. Does Java text. automatically convert it if it can without losing information? Yep. So we'll look, look at the uh, Android text view set text here. Okay. Probably has to construct And we have to go to the actual text view documentation and look for set text. And it has it has a whole bunch of methods called set text. There we go. All right, so what it is doing now is the wrong thing because it is using um, the first one. In other words, it's using the first protocol here because I'm giving an integer. My intent was to make it print the value of the integer, but it's not actually going to do it because it's treating the parameter as a resource ID. And I have no idea why it would treat it as a resource ID and what, is it, what that is going to buy me under what resource ID is zero. There we go. So let's look for resource ID. It doesn't say anything about the resource ID, but it's not going to print the value of the integer. Okay, it's using it for some other purpose, but not you know, printing the actual value of the integer. That means you know this is not going to work. Even though syntactically speaking, it's going to work, it's not going to work. So what we need to do is to do some you know manual casting. This is something that in Visual Basic will work. Okay, Visual Basic allows implicit casting, which means the uh, the interpreter will look at what is expected in the parameter and what is given to it, and it will look for ways to make the connection. And if you can find a way to make the connection. It will assume that that's what you want to do and do it for you. Java actually does not have the ability to do implicit casting. If you want to convert something from a number, a numerical value, to a string, you will have to do it yourself. This is you know, not generating any error because there's another way to use the, the method set text using only an integer as a parameter, but it doesn't do what we want it to do. Okay. <clears throat> I think the other you know, um, technique, okay, let me go back to this one here. I think what this is going to do is to look up uh, a resource with a resource ID. If that resource has a text in it, it will clone that text to, the, um, to this particular object. I think that's what it's going to do. <coughs> uh, it doesn't say here um, what it's going to do, so let me, but we are not going to test it here. Okay, the proper way to do this is to use um, the integer type to do it. Now the integer type is not just int the integer type. What I'm talking about here, oops, just delete more text than I should. Okay, the first thing we have to do is to do another import because it is not implicit. This time we're importing from Java dot lang dot, um, I think it's just integer. There we go. So this is a class, okay? You know, when you see something like this, it's either a class or an interface. This is actually a class. So Java, as a language, has a class called integer. And as a class, there are certain things you can do with it, including the conversion from um, a number to a string. So what we want to do here is to say integer, which is the name of the class itself. And then we're going to use the toString method of the class 
and then you have to specify the actual integer value that you're converting. In this case, it is counter value. There we go. So this is a rather long, you know, statement, and it's still complaining because syntax error on token delete this token. So it's the last one here. I got one too many. Here we go. So that's how we can you know, print a single integer value um, to the label of a text view. Are there any questions about this step? No questions? We don't have to go through this kind of trouble in App Inventor, did we? No. <laughs> well, we have other issues. We have limitations in that case. So we'll do this about the same thing with the other button. So this time I am going to copy and paste it. And we're going to deal with button two, which is my reset button. The reset button has a very simple job to do. All we want to do is to reset the counter value back to zero and then display it again. Does that make any sense? Yep, go ahead. What's the X that you got up there on line 19? On line Whatever. 19? Yeah, there's something. Oh, okay. There's a little X there, hover over. Multiple markers on this line, r.id cannot be resolved to a variable. Uh, well, it should be fine. But it does complain somewhere else. What's an X? But it's not in red. Okay. As suggestions. Okay, I think it's just missing a semicolon to the end. Nope, semicolon is over there. That is closed now there. Set the on click list there. Hmm. But it only complains on this line, but not the other line. Have you saved it yet? There we go. So you have to save it, you know, to make it resolve. Although in this case, you know, I don't know why I have to save it first because button one is already in the resources file at this point. Maybe it was because of the import. Mm, you know, it just maybe it's just a bug. Yeah, you, cha you probably just changed uh, something and it didn't update. Yeah. All right. So now we have you know most of the app already done. So we'll go ahead and start up a. AVD and give it a try. Well, as it's starting right now, you know, where did I put the <coughs> business logic of a counter? I put it inside the class, okay, because in, in Java you have to put everything inside the class. So that part we know already. The business logic is a part of a class, but which class is now containing the business logic? The main activity. Main activity, okay. And what is the main job of the class main acti activity? What is, it what is it supposed to represent? Loading the screen. The, the screen itself, right? You know, it is representing the screen itself. And we can also use it to you know, control what to do when the button is clicked. Okay. So the question now is, you know, is this the best way to do it? Or you know, if this is not the best way to do it, why is it not the best way to do it? and what are our alternatives? So those are the questions that we'll try to answer in today's lecture. Well, if it's very small, then probably, but any larger than that, then probably not. Or anything that might have extensions in the future, yeah. you know, then it, you have to eventually you know, change it. So we'll go ahead and run the app. It's gonna run, you know, it has you know, a little bit of a problem because initially, um, uh, yeah. The, the, the text is not going to show zero, it will yeah. still say hello world. That's what I was thinking. Which is not a big problem, I can fix that pretty easily. See, hello world is still here because you know when it's initialized, it didn't change anything. But as soon as I increment, it's okay, and I can click the reset button, and the counter works the way it's supposed to. So, cool, I mean, whatever problem is remaining here is pretty easy to fix, because all I have to do really is to do, you know, just copy and paste this line, Copy this line, control, and then uh, paste it down here. Any anywhere is fine. You know this is a good place to put it too. So once I have that problem fixed, 
If I run it again, save changes, yes. Go back to my emulator, and this time, you know, it is initialized to zero. I would not put that zero into the label of the text view and use that as a solution to replace you know, what I just did. Okay, that would not be a good solution. All right, so the app is all done. So what is the big deal of you know, this approach here? I mean, I only use one single file. You know, main activity is the only class that I need to define, and I put everything, the logic, you know, where I store the actual counter value, everything goes into main activity. Uh, it is simplistic, it works, so what else can be a problem here? Why is this not a good approach? What if you want to use the same functions in a different screen? Exactly. Okay, what if I want to use the same functions in a different screen? In other words, what if I change the layout of the you know, counter screen? What if, I, what if I don't want it to work this way? What if I want my app to work as, such, as follows? Okay, I just thought of this, okay? Uh, what if I wanted to you know, do the counter when I jerk it like this? And I want to reset the counter you know, when I hold it upside down and shake it like this. Well, I will have to rewrite everything, right? Not really just the counter logic. The counter logic is simple, okay? There's one way to trigger it to increment. There's another way to trigger it to reset. That's all I need to do in this case for that business logic. But in most applications, the complexity is the business logic. Think about it, your uh, online banking, okay? With online banking, um, what do you think would take up most of the programming time? Is it the programming of the user interface? If you have you know, a bank you know, uh, application, would it be the interface design itself, or would it be the actual logic behind the scenes that will allow you to do online payment, you know, schedule, uh, scheduled payment, uh, transfer of your money between the accounts and stuff like that. Which part do you think is uh, going to take up most of the most of the development time? Logic. The logic, right? The business logic. So the front end is not supposed to be, you know, taking up all that time. Now, if you put the logic into the front end instead of separating it, then every time you change the front end, you have to do something. Every time you change the business logic, you also have to do something about it. So it's not exactly the best way to do it. Um, the other thing I can also do with this application is, you know, instead of just changing the user interface from you know, just clicking buttons on the screen to like jerking it in a certain way, um, what if I want the counter to be remote? In other words, you know, I'm turning this into a, um, I'm turning this into a cloud application, and then people will say, "Are you crazy? You know, it's a simple counter application. You know, there's no need to use you know cloud in this case." Well, I beg to differ. Okay, well, why would I want to do this? You know, as a cloud application, let's just think about the um, the case in at Costco. Okay. I'm the guy, you know, standing, you know, next to the entrance. Um, I'm checking membership and I'm clicking that thing. Why do you think it it might be helpful to turn this into a cloud-based application, even though it's so simple, just counting? You will keep all the information synch synchronized to the network versus staying on the device and synchronizing whenever. Exactly, because you know that information. As soon as I click something, that will be updated on the remote database. And Costco can instantly know, okay, you know, okay, here are like five more people, you know, getting into, you know, the, uh, the store, and they can keep track of, you know, the approximate number of people in Costco at that time. But if I use it as a standalone application like this, then I can, the Costco can only get the number at the end of the day, or, you know, whenever they, you know, change shift and the person goes back and say, okay, I got, you know, this many people coming in, you know, in this hour. So even as simple as this, you know, I can potentially change the back end so that the counting is not really done here, and instead the counting is done you know, remotely, which means counter value, everything that I do with counter value here, here, and here, you know, may have to go away, and it has to be replaced by a, a, a method call to something that is much more complicated because it has to talk to the cloud, it has to get the actual value, from the cloud so that I can update it you know, in the next screen. Is that making any sense? 
So I can make funky changes to the user interface without changing the business logic, or I can change the business logic without making changes to the front end. Right? I mean, in the most extreme case, I can make changes to both. In other words, I can change the interface so I don't have to click on the screen. Instead, I just you know, do it like this for counting. Okay? But it's not counting on device either. You know, all the information is being sent back to the cloud, and Costco instantly knows you know, how many people are entering the facility at that time. So in that case, I'm changing both the user interface as well as the backend logic at the same time. Am I doing okay so far with uh, just explaining you know, what can be changed with a very simple application called counter? Is that good? Okay. So that is why this way of writing the program is not, may not be necessarily the best way to organize a program. Because the way I write this program you know, in a very hasty manner means that, you know, yeah, I can get the app up and running really quick, okay, especially for people who are more familiar with Java, they can just, you know, get all the code, you know, you know, you know typed up in no time. But the problem is, everything, it, this is a very, what I, what I would call a brittle program. In other words, if you try to make some changes to it, that change will propagate and, you know, invalidate a good portion of the program. So every time you want to make some changes to it, you have to make changes to a lot of portions. It's not flexible. You cannot make changes and localize the changes so that it doesn't impact the entire program. Is that okay so far? And this is just a very simple counter application. It's not even online banking. It's not, you know, the, it doesn't have the complexity of most applications. Yep. See how you casted the set text again? Absolutely. There are probably multiple ways to do it. Um, the way I did it here, I'm going to hide this <coughs> again so we can see the entire, oh, oops, close to the entire thing. So we can bring this a little bit too. This is the entire thing. So the way it does, the way I did it is I refer to the ID first, the resource ID. From the resource ID, I look up the actual view, which returns a view object. But a view object does not have a set text method. So I have to cast that whole thing to a text view first. So when you look at this entire thing, it is now a reference to a text view object. A text view object has a method called set text, and one of the signatures of set text expects a string. But now I have to convert counter value, which is an integer, into a string. And the way to do it, or one way to do it, is to use the toString method. It's a class method. It's not an instance method. It belongs to the entire class of integer. Yep. Uh, would you be able to uh, counter value dot toString? That would be, this that's an interesting question. I do not know. Nope. Counter value is an int, and as an int, it does not have a class affiliation. So there's no way to do a dot, you know, something after uh, counter value. That would be convenient. <laughs> I'm still remembering stuff from VB. Yeah, Java still has, you know, it's, new, it's still not 100% object oriented for efficiency sake. Like um, if it's a, if it, this type, then it should also have access to the, that. Uh, but integer is not int. That's the, that's the thing. An int is what they call a primitive type. It is not a class. Int is not a class. So int, char, bool, and a few other things are the only things that are not actual classes. Everything else in Java are actual classes. But the integer class is a wrapper around the int type for efficiency's sake. So unless you, you need to use something that is really specific to integer, you know, then you can cast an integer value into an integer object, or I should say an int value into an integer object. But other than that, you know, int is a much more efficient way of handling things. Because otherwise, you'll be passing references to integers around all day long. <laughs> that, that would not be efficient. It will also uh, generate a lot of, uh, in, well, if that is the case, you also, every time you want to use an integer, you have to say new uppercase integer in parentheses is value. 
um, which triggers a lot of memory allocation. And then every time you delete the object, it will trigger you know, the deletion. So your heap will be constantly being you know used, and it has to clean up. You know, so there are consequences of you know not uh, using primitive types, and that I think is a compromise. All right. So are we still okay with this example at this point? Does everybody understand what it does and how it gets it done at this at, at this time? Is there a less verbose way of doing it? Sorry? Is there a less verbose way of doing it? A less verbose way of? Like this, it's something like, you know. Printing an integer? <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just so long. It's, it's um, like it doesn't really do much. I do not know of any way to do it um, because the, it has to do with the set text method, not having a, an ability to check just an integer as you know the, the thing that you want to print. It has one signature that takes an int, but that one you know, is taking a resource ID, and the documentation doesn't say anything about it. Uh, but what I think is, it's going to use it's going to use the text of a particular resource, of another item, a button or whatever, whatever, and use the text of that thing to clone to this particular item. So that's what the other set, uh, set text ID you know is supposed to do, or at least what I think it should do. I mean, that would be pretty easy to test. All right, so if, this, if there's no question about this one, or this you know, little project here, uh, the next thing we'll do is to go back to the notes. And this time, we'll talk about the more complicated way of doing things. Um, instead of doing the, uh, talking about the text part here, let's just focus on the pictures again. You know, this is a. The first one, you know, if you see the little match stick, when you see the little match stick figure up top, uh, on top, um, and also the bubble, it's called a use case diagram. A use case diagram, for those of you who took CISP 362, it should kind of remind you of something that you learned in that class. Let me just kind of see if anyone remembers anything about use case diagrams. Does anyone know what a use case diagram is useful for? <laughs> yeah, it's for use cases. Yep. Right. It states, you know, the objective or the function of the application. Okay. It states the function of the application. So in this case, my app only has one function. Its only one function is to count something. So the words inside the bubble should be verbs. Okay, or should involve action. Um, an actor, you know, I mean, you see, but you see that you know, the matchstick figure has an actor under it. Um, an actor is basically anyone external to the application who can interact with the application. So an actor can actually be a, another computer system if you have a cloud-based application. But in this case, you know, we have the Costco employee, you know, doing the clicking. So it's actually a an end user. But I didn't have a specific name for that end user. I just called it, you know. Um, an actor. And also the actor is an entire class of people. It's not a single person. All right. So we start with this one here, you know, just to make it very clear what is the purpose, what is the function, or what are the functions in some cases of a particular application or computer system. This approach works for apps. It also works for entire information systems. Are we okay with the first picture, the use case diagram? It seems like we're missing something here. You know, what about resetting that counter? Well, resetting a counter is an action associated with the use case of counting something. And that's why it does not have its own use case. In other words, you cannot say, oh, I want to download and install your app because I want to reset a counter. Does that make sense to you? That you, know, you might want to download an application just so that you can reset a counter? No, it's it's a it's a facility to facilitate this particular use case. Count up, and sometimes I might want to reset it. And that's why resetting the counter is not a use case. It is not a reason why someone is buying your app, basically. All right. So now that we know that, the next thing we can do is to use a state diagram. This is the first time I actually use a state diagram in this class as an example. But in this case, it is particularly useful, okay, and I'll explain why it is useful. This is a, a state machine diagram in the UML. It describes the behavior of the application. 
So in this case, it describes the behavior using uh, what we call states and also transitions between the states. There are four, uh, three states in this diagram. There's a beginning state, or we also call this the start state. There's the final state, which is you know, the state where we stop. And in between, we have a, you know, just a regular uh, state in between. The arrows are called transitions. We have a transition going from the initial state to the state called ready to count. Now, when you look at a state, the labeling of a state should not be a verb, okay? Because um, it is a state that the computer system is in, so it's, it should not be a verb. It's not doing something. It is being something, okay? So in this case, you know, this particular state has a description of ready to count, which is descriptive. It is an adjective. It is describing what is the current state of the system. Okay, it's ready for ready to count. When you have a state, um, in this state here, we have two transitions that go back to itself. Now, with each transition, you can see that there are, there's one part here before the slash, and then one part here that is after the slash. The part that is before the slash is called an event or a trigger. That is what is happening from the outside that is causing the state transition. Okay, so in, in the first case, you know, initialize model is a is a trigger. It causes the machine to, or the state machine to go from the initial state to ready to count because we are initializing the model. And uh, the model is basically the business logic of an application or a representation of that. But from ready to count, we have two loops here, okay, so-called loops, but they're not exactly loops in programming. One way to go back to itself to trigger a transition and go back to itself is the increment event, okay? There's a request to say, I want to do an increment, okay? But that event is just, you know, an abstract event. I didn't say whether a button was clicked. I didn't say whether the phone was, you know, jarred or, you know, jerked like that. Uh, I did not say whether it's a remote device, like a Bluetooth device, okay? I didn't say anything. I just say that there's something, event, or some ha something happening outside of the state machine that's triggering the operation. As a response to that operation, I can specify an action. So update count here is just a name to um, signify, okay, when this transition is happening, I want to perform this operation. I want to update the counter. Okay. Now, update count is intended as an output. Okay, so whoever is supposed to know about the current state of the counter should be notified. Okay, that it has just changed. I just you know I want to change it to one more than what it was before. Is that okay so far? So that is one transition. The other transition is about the same. Okay, except instead of an increment event, I have a reset event. So it can be a reset event like touching a button can be an event like you know someone is just you know holding the phone upside down for two seconds or something like that okay it doesn't matter how the event is was generated it is just something happening outside of this machine that is triggering this machine to uh, go through that transition but after I reset the event I also have to remember to go back and update the count again so that whoever is supposed to know the count value now knows oh okay it has just been reset to something is that all making sense so far? Okay. And this is the last transition. It's called exit model. In other words, something external to the state machine says, okay, we're ready to quit. Okay. And the state machine, you know, has one last chance to do something, you know, which is you know signified by clean up UI. Now, I really should not use UI here, which is user interface. I should just say, you know, clean up or signify to whoever needs to use the counter value and say, okay, I'm stopping now. You won't be getting any more number or any more updates from me. So it's just basically a hook so that if you need to attach any code, there's a place to attach that code at this point. Are we still doing okay so far with this state diagram? Is that okay? Now, the state diagram describes the business logic. This is the business logic of the entire thing, okay? Somebody can say, okay, let's get, let's get started, okay? I want to create an instance of this model to keep track of a counter value, okay? That's the first transition. Um, someone can say, after it is created, and say, I want to increment now, okay? Do whatever it takes to increment the value, 
and let somebody else know about the current value of the counter. It has a reset event, same thing, okay? You know, somebody can request a reset. I want to turn the counter back to zero at this point. Um, and then the state machine has to say, well, I can do that, but I also want to update whoever needs to know the value that it is now back to zero. And then we have the exit code. That's the business logic. Did I describe anything about the user de uh, interface design here? Did I mention anything about buttons? Or you know, jerking the phone, you know what it what would actually trigger the increment or the reset of the counter? Not a single thing. I just know that something will tell me it's time to increment. Something will tell me it's time to reset it, but not exactly saying, oh, but I know what is going to trigger that. I do not know yet. Okay. So we are still doing okay so far. All right. This is a good time to go to my file. We may not have enough time today to finish this entire slide. Uh, I have a counter app here, which is a zip file. So we'll go ahead and download this file. It's just a zip file. We'll, you know, do whatever you need you know, with your operating system to unzip it into the workspace. So I'm going to open it up. I usually don't do it through the GUI, you know, but this time I did. The only time I did it, it doesn't work. All right, so we'll go ahead and do it in using the command line. Okay, so we'll go to workspace, and we'll do an unzip. I suspect it's going to be in downloads. Nope, it's probably intended. <coughs> oh, tab is for everybody. Let's counter here. Counter does it. Is it here? Yeah, yep. it's right, So we'll go ahead and unzip the whole thing. And of course, Eclipse may get a little bit confused at this point because I just you know unzip the file when it's still running. So I probably it's probably a good idea to get out of Eclipse and then go back in, or you know see if it has a refresh. Is that link with editor collapse? Let's collapse all. No, that won't do it. Top level element. If it's in the temp directory, you won't see it until you. No, I unzip unzipped it already. Yeah. You unzipped it, but where? I unzipped it into workspace. And it did not exist to begin with. Did not exist to begin with. Okay, then you need to go to file. Uh, Refresh. It won't show there until you import it. So go to file. Import compiler. Android. Okay. Android. Okay, let me try something else. I'll try the good old engineering approach, turn it off and turn it back on again. It, <laughs> it doesn't take that? No. Unless you import it, it does not exist in the interface. In the registry? Yep, you're right. Existing code project directory. It's already in workspace. Counter. Copy project to workspace. It's already there. No need to copy. Finish. Invalid project description. Oh. It actually wants to import it over there. What did you say again? You don't have to specify the counter folder. Just specify workspace. Just specify work there. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, what's the project that you select the project? Okay. Got it. So just specify workspace. Yeah, select. Ah, okay. That makes sense. Of course, we have problems elsewhere, too. <laughs> <laughs> Click copy project. Copy to a new name. You mean 
may try, you may be trying to overlap the same parking space. Right, because it's already there. Okay. But try try to move it to another workspace. Oh, try to refresh. No. Go ahead, sorry. Try to move it to another workspace. Then. Moving it move out the, of move the whole the, the out of the workspace the first. Yeah. yeah. Or when I import it, I can import it as a different name. New project name. Yeah, that's it. So if I can edit this, I can import it to counter one. That might work. Yeah, bet you that's the problem. Probably. Invalid project description. It overlaps the location. Okay, I have to move it out of, out of the uh, the whole space first. That's it. I've never had that issue. <laughs> Windows. <laughs> okay, so we'll move counter to the temp folder, and then we'll go import it from the temp folder. Import. Existing. Browse. All right, so it knows it's counter. New project name is counter. Add project working set. That's a whole different thing. Copy okay. projects to workspace. Finish. Yep, that worked. I cannot just you know unzip it into the, the workspace. Okay. All right. So now we are into this project here. And we'll take a look at the source code, and you can see that the source code is a little bit more complicated. Um, it has a few classes here, but we'll focus on the model first. You see? So we're going to expand here, and this is the actual model itself. Um, so if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, uh, that's the Java code for the model itself. Now, it's, it's not complicated. Okay? It only has a few things to do. It keeps track of a value, just like the last time. You know, we have a uh, instance variable called value. Um, it has one method called increment. It has one method called reset. It has one method called start. Okay, and it has a particular another member called UI adapter. UI adapter is used here when I increment by value. I'm going to say, hey, whoever is responsible to keep track of the counter or to display the counter or to make use of the count value, you better make use of it now, okay? Because, you know, I just updated it. Um, whenever I reset the value to zero, same thing. I'm just saying, if you need to know the count value, this is a good place to get notified that the count value has changed. Uh, the starting point here is also to reset it, which is uh, done here at this part here. All right, so this... If you look, if you just look at this class here, does it tell you anything, anything at all, about you know what is going to trigger all these operations to happen, mm. or what is going to happen when you do some updates? Does it say anything about it's updating remotely, you know, at a Costco server? Does it say anything about you know, do uh, am I using a button to trigger the operation, or am I using motion to trigger the operation, you know, counting and resetting? None whatsoever, right? So this is capturing only the business logic, okay? Keeping track of the value and, you know, incrementing the value and also resetting the value. Are we doing okay so far with the business logic? Is that okay? <coughs> Do you see a relationship between, you know, this code here and the picture that we were looking at before and this one here? I mean, the words are different, but do, do you see, you know, a particular resemblance between these two? All of the triggers, okay, all of the triggers, which is whatever is to the left-hand side of the slash, they become methods inside the model class. Is that, is that what you're seeing too? And then the response to a trigger, which is whatever is on the right-hand side of the slash, those become operations in the um, in the method to handle that trigger. Do you see a resemblance? Yep, kind of. Maybe. Nope. Nobody sees any resemblance between those two. <laughs> you, 
Okay. All right. So maybe you know after we go a little bit further, we'll start to see you know what uh, how this is related to the model itself. Okay. But what about the screen? So this is one end of the entire thing. Okay, which is the model end. So we are talking about a design. Uh, this is what we call a design pattern, which is which is a field of software engineering. It has to do with how do you separate components. Um, of a particular program, application, or an entire information system into different portions so that if you make changes to one, it doesn't trigger a lot of changes to everything else. We want to be able to contain that change. So on one end, we have the model, which consists of data structures and the logic related to the business, related to the actual function of the application. But it has absolutely no idea of what the user, user interface may look like. It just knows that the user may trigger something, okay? The user may do something and ask me to increment a counter. The user <coughs> needs to do something to ask me to reset a counter, and the user needs to know the current state of the count value. That's all that the model knows, okay? On the other end, we have something that is called a view. <coughs> okay, so we have a model and a view, and let me show you what the code of the view looks like. The code of the view is starting with something that we are quite familiar with, which is main activity. At main activity. So let's take a look at this code here. Um, it is almost the same or very similar to what we usually do things. Um, just don't pay attention to the adapter stuff first. Um, do we recognize this stuff here? For the most part. Yeah, it just sets up you know, what a button is going to do, right? Okay. Excuse me. In this case, I did you know, name the buttons accordingly, according to the function. <coughs> so button reset is to do the reset thing, and the button uh, increment is doing the increment thing. So, all right, so that's you know, good old familiar stuff. Nothing surprising here, right? Uh, the only extra stuff is, you know, hey, there's a something called an adapter, um, and we have to do certain things about the adapter. But once we have the adapter created, we can just say, hey, adapter, go do your reset, and adapter, go do your increment. Okay. Does this show you or tell you anything about the business logic of resetting a counter or incrementing a counter, or what needs to happen when you do stuff like that? Nope, nothing, right? Doesn't say anything about you know what is you know, what needs to be done when I say reset. Doesn't say a single thing about what needs to happen when I increment. Um, okay, so now we have a model that captures you know everything that the business lo logic needs to do. Okay, which has to do with incrementing and resetting in this case. We have the view which is in this case implemented by main activity, which, the, which has everything that you need to specify to deal with buttons, text views, and blah, 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 all the actual concrete user interaction elements. What we're missing here is how do they connect? And then the adapter, right? So now we want to take a look at the adapter and figure out, hey, what is it going to do in between? What is an adapter going to do? I have an entire package you know, just to you know, deal with the adapters. So we'll take a look at the adapters. There are two sub-adapters that I define here. Let's take a look at UI adapter here. UI adapter is not a class. It is a, it's an interface. Um, as an interface, it simply says it's a filter. Okay? You know, whatever object I want to be able to pass as a UI or user interface adapter has to supply these two methods. One method is to update the counter or update a count to the value that is passed. Okay? Now, am I going to display the count value on the screen? Am I going to use clicks to indicate, like, you know, use the, uh, the vibration mechanism and go to mean, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, for accessibility? No, I didn't say a single thing. Okay? Uh, am I using a braille, you know, a touch-based you know, interface for people who, who, have, who are blind? I didn't say a single thing. I just say that, well, you know, whoever is, whichever object 
is going to implement UI adapter, it needs to implement, this has to be a way, a method, to update the count and let the end user know about the update of the count value. That's all. Um, and it has a second method called register model, which, is, which allows a user interface adapter to understand you know, which model is associated with this particular adapter. Because I need some way to link the adapter of the user interface to the model. And then we can look at um, a model adapter. A model adapter is basically an adapter. Okay, so let's see, let's take a look at the interfaces here. There's an interface here, and there's an interface here. Okay, the interface here basically says uh, we are dealing with a model adapter here. So the model adapter is an interface. It basically says the model needs to have several methods for, in this case, to be defined, and those can pass through the interface to be seen by whatever is standing behind it. The other one, the one that we saw earlier, is called the UI adapter. The UI adapter has two methods, okay? One is to display or update the counter value to the screen or whatever that is actually doing the output. And the other one is to register um, how do I link back to the back end of the model. Are we still doing okay so far with this methodology? So we're still missing the center piece, right? We're still missing something in the middle here. We have the adapter class, uh, adapter interface itself. The adapter interface itself is an extension of both the model adapter and the UI adapter. In other words, we're combining these two. So this is a model adapter. This is a UI user interface adapter. So I'm creating a new interface. Okay, so here's a new interface here, which takes whatever is coming from the model adapter. It also <laughs> takes whatever is coming in to the UI adapter. And it has one extra field called an extra method called create model. Okay. But this is just an interface. Now as an interface, someone, someone has to implement the interface for an interface to become useful. Am I still doing okay so far? This becomes the actual adapter interface. It specifies everything that a class that implements this, inter this, this adapter needs to supply. So now we have the code to do the association, which is basic adapter. Now basic adapter is really just a fairly simple class, you know, all it does is to uh, repeat something, okay? If you look at basic adapter, it is a class, it implements adapter. In other words, now we have another class, and it is filtering through uh, the adapter interface so that the rest of the world will only know it by whatever method is defined through the interface. Still doing okay so far with that? And this is the actual code. The actual code uh, will start with the well. We'll start with the register view part. Okay, register view is this part here. It is a method so that you know the adapt an adapter object or basic adapter object, I should say, so that a basic adapter object can link itself to the view. Okay, so if you look at this is the uh, view from the class and interface perspective. If I go back here and look at the object diagram, so what I'll do is I have an object actually representing the model. So this is a model object. On the other hand, I have a view object, which is our main activity object here, but I'll call this a view object here. There'll be an intermediate project in between called an adapter object. An adapter object is of the type basic adapter in this case, and it serves as the intermediate thing so that the model object doesn't need to know a single thing about the view. The view doesn't have to know a single thing about the model. All they have to know is about the adapter itself. Okay? And that's why we have this little method here. This method allows the adapter 
to say, oh, okay, I know which view object I'm supposed to use. The next method, which is register model, allows the adapter mo uh, object to know which model object it is supposed to use. So that would be this link here. Are we still doing okay so far? Now this is really useful because the update count method, which is a part of the adapter interface, is really just saying, oh, okay, since I know what my view object is, I'm just going to defer that to my view object, okay? So view object, go ahead and do your discount thing here. Um, I have a reset method. The reset method is deferred to the model. In other words, if an adapter object was asked to say, okay, do whatever you need to do to reset. I don't know what to do you know, to, to do a reset, but you know what? I know the object representing the business logic behind this whole thing. I'll go ask that object to do the reset thing because you know, that object will know how to do the reset. Do you see what's going on here? It's really just there to, to delegate tasks, but not to perform a single one. Is that okay? And so the rest are pretty much the same thing. There's only one thing that is kind of extra to this whole thing, which is create model, okay? Which is a method that is, but why do we need a create model here, you know, so that I can create a new model, which is here? It has to do with which part of your program gets control first? That is the question. Where, what is the first time your code gets control of an application, of an Android app? On create, okay? On create, the on create method is the first time that your application, that you have control over something when your app runs. Is that making any sense? And it's inside main activity. So let's switch to main activity again and say, okay, so here we have control because we are inside the on create method of an activity. Great. The first thing it does on line 19 is to say, okay, super class, go do your own on create thing. Okay, we have no idea what other things it has to do, but that's okay because we'll just say, okay, there's some stuff that needs to be done first. On line 20, we set content view to a particular layout. That code is generated by Eclipse as well because we are just saying, Oh, you know what? I want this particular activity to have this text view and those two buttons on the screen at those coordinates. And that's what you know, uh, line 20 is going to do. Same stuff that we have done before. No big deal. Line 21 is when we start to make use of this um, uh, it's called a the word just escaped me design pattern, okay? This is the first part that actually has to do with this particular design pattern, is to say, well, the screen, which is the user interface, doesn't know anything about the back end, but it does know something about the adapter because it has to you know, know which adapter it's supposed to link to. So line 21 is creating the adapter itself and have the view object, which in this case is the, our main activity object, to say, okay, from here on, I know that if I need to do something, if somebody clicks a button or do whatever, I know I can defer to the adapter object to decide what to do with that. Is that okay? So it's a link back. On line 21, we are making a link from the uh, view object to the adapter object. On line 22, we have a register view this which is basically, you know, having this link established. That's on line 22. I could have combined this into one single call, but I think it is better to separate it into two because I can change the constructor of basic adapter so that it will take adapter, uh, the uh, local variable adapter here as a parameter. But I did not do that because I want to separate it into two different steps. Now here comes the create model. Because at this point, no one, okay, before line 23, we have the view object, we have the adapter object. 
we make sure that the new object knows where to find the adapter object. We make sure that the, adap the, adap the, the adapter object knows where to find the view object. But we are, at that point, we're missing one really important thing. Who is doing the real work? Well, line 23 is saying, adapter, you know who's supposed to do the real work. Go ahead and create that object representing the business not logic. And that's what the create model is going to do. Are we doing okay so far with this you know, methodology? Sort of. Okay. And that's the, that's the last thing to do. I mean, the last thing to do is you know, create model, which is on line 23, which has two things to do. One is it will trigger the adapter object to create a model object. And then the second thing it would do is to have the model object to self-register itself back to the uh, adapter object here. And then the third thing it would do is to tell the model object and say, you know what, you just got created. You got something to do now? Well, the, uh, mod the model object says, yep, sure, I got one thing to do. I want to initialize that counter value that is being displayed on the screen. So when you look at the... Um, create model, which is in basic adapter, it has got these, these things, the three things to do. The first thing is to create the model object. The second thing is to say, okay, I want um, to register the model object um, with myself so that I create that link you know, from the model back to myself. And then the third thing is going to do is to say, hey, model object, you're getting started now. This is equivalent to the link from or the transition from the initial state to the only state of the state diagram. This line here, line 33 that we are looking at at this point, is implementing in the browse in the uh, in the state diagram this transition here. I'm initializing. Are we still doing okay so far? Now this seems to be a lot of code that is completely unnecessary. A lot of complexity that is, seems to be artificial. I mean, if I were you know, learning how to do app programming the first time and have no exposure prior to um, do any type of you know, complex programming, I would certainly look at the two programs or the two projects. Okay, let me go back to here. I would look at counter and then I would look at simple counter and say, why go through all that trouble with counter when we can just do simple counter and it looks the same, the app works and whatnot? Well, I can show you one difference here. If I want to change the business logic, which is, has to do with uh, the model, which is down here, okay? If I don't want to um, do, well, I guess in this case, you know, the model really doesn't have a whole lot to change because uh, it really is just a counter, right? Um, but if I want to do any type of changes to the user interface, I can do the, all the changes here and have no, no change whatsoever to the model itself. And even to most of the adapters, there's no change. Because as long as an adapter is going through the same interface, um, there's no need to change anything. Okay, the, if I change this uh, main activity here, so that instead of using a button or two buttons to mean you know, increment and reset, instead I use you know, uh, uh, motion to trigger those events. Okay, so let's say we make you know, substantive changes to this code here, so that we recognize you know, getting jerked you know, this way and having it face down for two seconds. So let's say we have that logic already done. Okay, which part of this code do we have to modify? This code goes away because it is just saying, okay, well, since we don't have a button anymore, that code goes away. This code also goes away because we don't have any buttons anymore. And instead, we'll have the logic to interpret motion, right? The question is, when we recognize those motions, what are we going to do? Same thing. One motion will trigger adapter.reset. The other motion will still trigger adapter.increment. That part does not change at all. Is that making any sense? Now, but there is one change that has to happen, right? I mean, 
Uh, what about um, what about what about the logic that actually does the the change? This method also may also need to be changed. This method is a method of the view object to actually reflect the current value of the counter. So if I want to use a completely touch and motion based you know, counter, then this method also has to be modified because I'm not going to display anymore. I'm going to use you know, like vibration to tell the user the current value of the counter. Is that okay? So that part has to be changed. But as long as the method remains as update count, it will still be able to implement counter view. Because counter view is a is an interface that simply says, okay, you know, we are just, you know, uh, counting. We have the ability to update a counter. It may be displayed, it may be you know, using shaking, it may be sent to a remote server, but I have a way to reflect the count value to someone, to something. What about the adapters? Yep, go ahead. Is there a way to abstract the, the triggers that does the implement the reset as well? Right the, now, it, it seems like... Uh, right now, well, we, are, we, are, we cannot see the abstraction here because the buttons are registered. This is as low level as it gets mm -hmm. you know, to the actual user interface. Mm -hmm. So we are attaching that logic to on click. Now, if you want to use the you know, motion to do that, the only part you have to do is to have one, you know, you will have to get a event listener corresponding to motions. Okay, so that thing will actually have to have some kind of logic to remember to know how you know, you're moving the, the your handset. You just have to call this at a different place. Adapter reset and adapter increment they have to be moved into some other code because you don't have buttons anymore when you use you know shake and having it face down to do the reset and the increment counter. But it's got it's still going to be these two calls that will allow your view, which is the user interface, to link to the model through an adapter. Is that is that okay? Yeah, I understand that, but um, I'm just wondering if, if there's a way to do it so that in this code. You implement there, a method. There's an abstraction as to what caused the implemented reset, and if the implementation of the buttons or the, uh, the motion right. to cause the increment reset stuff somewhere else in another class somehow. That would be pretty hard to do because I can have main activity can have a reset method, main activity can have its increment method. That's fine. But who is going to trigger the execution of those methods? The adapter does cannot do it, right? The adapter is only sitting here in between. It knows enough about the object model, uh, the uh, model object, to say, okay, you know, you need to do something. Somebody request something, go do it. Okay. It also knows how to reflect back a result and say, okay, the model has now made some changes, has made some updates. Um, you might need to know. Somebody might need to know that. So it will go through the adapter and go back to the view object and say, oh, you might have to do something to display this new value now. So the adapter object cannot trigger uh, the actual action of reset and increment. And only this, only the main activity in this case has the right, is, is, the, is the right place to specify the trigger point. Because you know, if you register uh, another listener for motion, so the logic to interpret you know, a jerking motion like this and a face down you know, uh, position like this will be somewhere in this program. And that is the trigger to, up, to use a reset and increment. So there's no easy way to abstract those two out to a particular place because that really ties into the actual mechanism of triggering the reset and the increment actions. What about the rest? Can we still use you know, basic adapter? You 
Badger, okay? Because what does basic adapter really need? What what is limiting? You know what what can we can use with uh, with basic adapter? If you go to basic adapter, it looks like this. Um, the view, what is a, a, a counter view? Is an interface. Okay, it's not even a class. It's just an interface. So whatever object that can implement counter view can go here. Whatever class or whatever object that implements counter model can also go here. So we don't even have a class hierarchy restriction here. It is all of these are just interfaces. But you can see, you know, how you can make changes to only one part of the program, and now it has zero impact to the rest of the program. If I just want to change the way I do the actual interface, let's say I want to use, you know, uh, swipe motion. Okay, so I want to use a horizontal swipe to mean increment. And let's say a vertical swipe to mean your know, reset. Okay, which part of the program do I have to modify? Everything is going to be just here, because swipe motion on a canvas can actually be a, you know, handled by events. Is that making any sense? More or less. Is the counter application sim a simple application, or do you think it's a kind of complicated application to begin with? It's a fairly simple application. So if you have a complicated application, then the benefit of this approach is even more, because what you can do now is to separate an application development into two of, well, actually, yeah, it's more like two distinct phases. You can have people working agreeing on the adapter portion, okay? In other words, you are now saying, okay, there has to be a way to trigger this operation, there has to be a way to trigger that operation, and so on. And then you have another agreement going the opposite way, basically to say, okay, we have these things that might need to be updated. Either the end user or the you know, cloud server may need to know about these things that are updated from the model. As long as those things are agreed on, you can have one group, of one group of developers working on the view part of the code, doing the screen design and all the other stuff, motion detection and whatnot. And then you can have another team of developers completely independently work on the model code. Because the model code is now only capturing the business logic without having to know a single thing about the user interface and vice versa. Is that, is that part making any sense? If you do not do this separation and everything is rolled into main activity, then you have no ability to separate the project into two distinct parts and say you work on the business logic and you work on the user interface because they need to work one work on the same file, right? And whatever changes you make to one portion of the program can severely impact the other portion of the program. Whereas in this way, they cannot impact each other at all. What about testing? How would this you know, do anything about testing? Think about testing your application. Would this method lend itself to testing the business logic of the program? Let me cast that question in a different way. Typecast, right? Okay, let me re rephrase the question in a different way. Using, um, okay, let, let's be very specific. Go to the actual program so we can look at the source code. So most of the logic of simple counter, which does not use this really complicated way of sec uh, dissecting a program into portions, everything is contained here. Okay, this is my entire program is inside the class main activity. Is there any way for me to automat automatically test this code without any user clicking something and actually seeing the update? On the screen. You you can inject you know uh, events you know as I said you know you can inject events by um, in you know in you, that's that's possible, but when you inject events it depends on the location too, so it, it it's possible but it's not easy okay so if I use this method, the approach that most people use to test the program 
is really to run the program, have another person to follow a script and say, press the you know, increment button, you should see the counter incrementing. Uh, press the reset button, you should see the, re the number reset back to zero. And that's how it would describe uh, the test procedure. Is that okay? So it, it doesn't lend itself to automation. I cannot just say, okay, you know, test the program automatically or test the business logic automatically. Fine. So now the question is, how is this approach, which is far more complicated when it comes to the number of classes, interface, and spreading code all over the place, how is this going to help when I want to test the business logic automatically? It's easy. All I need to do is instead of having a main activity like that, I have a main activity that follows a certain script, and what it does is it would trigger, you know, adapter.reset, it will trigger adapter.increment, and then it will capture um, update count to see if the count updated is the correct value. Because it, it doesn't need anything to be clicked, it can generate those commands going this way autonomously. I can, t I can build it into this class here, okay? You know, which is probably not a good idea, but I can do it. I can say public void self test. And now I can put my self test code here, or a good portion of the self test code here, because what I can do now is I can say adapter.reset, okay? Change it to zero, and then update count should have a zero you know, pass back here. So I will need to intercept this, put that value into my own you know, instance variable, and then I can check it. Okay? In other words, if I really want to do it this way, I can do it like this. Okay? So I would need another private local variable in here. Uh, we'll call it self test calendar. And then I will make use of self test counter here, and I will say self test counter equals v. And then down here, I can now say if self test counter does not equal to zero, I can now throw, in a throw an exception because right after reset, self test counter should be zero at this point. And then I can do you know, another adapter dot increment test self test counter. Is it one now? Am I making any sense? So you can do any you can do self testing um, internally without having to use you know, somebody to click the buttons to test the business logic of your application. Is that making a little bit of sense here? Yeah. Uh, going back to my uh, previous question, right. uh, this seems like it would be nice to be able to abstract. Uh, I mean, we abstract the view, right? It, to me, the view is sort of just the output of the view. It serves your as both the output and the input. Okay, one way to look at this is to use the client server model, okay, which is not exactly the same thing as what we hear, what we have here. What we have here is called an MBA approach, okay, or the MBA design pattern. Can anyone guess what is MBNA? Model view adapter. Yep, model view adapter approach. But you can also look at this as a client, you know, approach, client server approach. A view object is really kind of like a client at a restaurant. Um, the model is more like the restaurant itself. Okay. So what exactly is the adapter? Well, you can make this you know, into the restaurant kitchen, which is the place that the food is actually prepared and dishes are washed. Does that make any sense? So who do you think is the adapter? The waiter. The waiter. Yep. So in the case where you don't have the separation, then you have the client talking directly to the to the kitchen, or people working in the kitchen directly interacting with the client. 
If you do not have any separation of the view and the model, you're cooking for yourself. Because there's no separation, right? You know, the person who's doing the requesting, you know, I want to have scrambled egg today, okay, is the same person who is going to cook. But in this case, it's it's you know it's layered, which means if the client talks to the waiter and say, I want to have you know scrambled egg, and then the waiter talks to the model and say, Okay, we want scrambled egg. When the scrambled egg is actually done, then it's passed back to this one here and then passed back to the client. But it, it seems like right now, for this specific example, mm -hmm. the client, to me, seems like it's just receiving the result of the kitchen. Right? Yeah. But there isn't anything related to the client making a request for, uh, for what to cook. Right? Okay, the that, code that part is, seems like it, it's an activity made. It's right here. This is where this is where you place the order. The the code to actually place the order is to tell the waiter, okay, I want a scrambled egg. But how do you when do you you make that request? It's up to the client. Yeah, but this is in in the activity class which encompasses this whole thing, right? The activity class is the class related to the view object. If you look at the actual yeah. class definitions up there, mm -hmm. main activity implements counter view. And counter view is the filter that says, okay, you know, any counter view needs to implement these particular things. Any view object needs to implement you know, two methods. And counter view is what uh, an adapter. So there are two adapters here. Okay, there's one that one more. No, excuse me, not adapter. There's another interface here. So there's another interface here called um, counter view. Is one interface. There's another interface here called um, model uh, counter model. That's it. Counter model. So everything is attached by interfaces and not by classes. So there's no restriction in terms of inheritance. This has to inherit from that, and that has to inherit from this. There's no inheritance um, restriction. Uh, there's only you know implementation in restriction. So kind of, I will probably stop the lecture at this point um, because you really kind of have to look into the source code a little bit to kind of track it down. You know which component is you know talking to which other component. And how do they know, hey, how do I know this interface or this user interface can do this? Okay, you know, through what mechanism do I know that I can say, well, the model is updating the counter, but how does it know, you know, who can update, you know, the, the value on the screen? You know, who can let somebody know about the update of the value? Well, it, the first thing it does is it triggers a call to the adapter object. The adapter object knows you know, which view object is associated, and the view object gets it done. But the mechanism to pass that call along has nothing to do with inheritance. Everything is done by interface. So there are, there are really two aspects of interfacing here. The first aspect of interfacing is called the adapter concept, which is you know, having a middle layer in between to separate the view from the model. So that's one interface. The other interface is the use of the Java language feature feature called interface. And that basically makes sure that I do not place unnecessary inheritance restriction on any of the classes that I'm creating. Yep. Uh, do you think it's possible to share the code with us? Say again? Uh, is it possible to share the project with us just to uh, folks can review the code and make sure? Yeah, to share the what? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's on the uh, on Moodle already. Okay. It's that one zip file that is below the uh, the topic itself. Okay. It's a zip file. You have to do what I just did. You have to unzip it into a folder, and then inside Eclipse, you say import from that folder. So I'm going to stop the lecture now because I think we got through enough stuff today. <laughs>